Hello, everyone. This is the 48th episode of the Soccer Nostalgia Talk podcast. As always, this is Sean from Los Angeles, and I'm joined by Paul from Shipley in England. For this episode, we welcome back Argentine journalist Mr. Nacho Di Mari as we discuss the Argentina national team matches under Cesar Luis Menotti in the calendar year of 1976. We aim to have a series of interviews with Mr. Di Mari as we examine the Cesar Luis Menotti era as Argentina national team manager. Welcome back, Nacho. Hi, thank you. How are you? Very well. Last time we discussed the years 1974 and 1975, the first two years of Cesar Luis Menotti in charge of the Argentina national team. Argentina were to host the 1978 World Cup and Menotti was tasked with preparing the team to finally win the World Cup. Menotti had used the 1974 and 1975 years for experimentation purposes and many new caps were called up. The year 1976, with the World Cup getting closer, Menotti continued to experiment to find the right balance and ideal makeup for the team. There would also be matches against European opposition to prepare the squad against different styles. There would also be continuous debate and concerns whether Argentina was capable of hosting a World Cup with stadium work behind schedule and the political situation, which we shall get to. For the first match for the calendar year 1976 would be on February 25th as part of Copa del Atlantico as well as Copa Felix Bogado. Paraguay would be hosting Argentina at Asuncion. For this match, Menotti selected the following squad. Ricardo La Volpe in goal from San Lorenzo. Of course, we know La Volpe would eventually become the Mexico national team manager. In yes, he's, he's, later. He's, he's, living, he's living there right now. And he's partially Mexican from a long time ago. Then you have Andres Rebotaro of Newell's Old Boys. Alberto Tarantini of Boca Juniors. Juan Pablo Cardenas of Racing Club, Daniel Killer of Rosario Central, he replaced by Julio Assad of Vélez Sarsfield in the 68th minute, Americo Gallego of Newell's Old Boys, Ricardo Boccini of Independiente, Marcello Trobiani of Boca Juniors, Oscar Ortiz of San Lorenzo, and he'd be replaced by Rene Hausman of Huracan in the 57th minute. Capping the side, Mario Kempes of Rosario Central. And a new cap, Hector Horacio Scotta of San Lorenzo. He was surnamed El Gringo, El Gringo Cota. His most impressive skill was that he shot, he has a, a terrible shot. He was right wing and it was something like a rocket. For this very first match, he would stand out as he would celebrate with a hat trick. He scored in the 11th, 38th, and 52nd minute. The match ended as a 3 2 win for Argentina. Aquino had given the lead for Paraguay in the fourth minute before Scotta scored his three goals, and Baez scored another goal in the 53rd minute to give this final score of 2 3 for Argentina. Something we should mention, for this match, initially the players had refused to travel because they were not satisfied with the payments from the federation. Mm-hmm. However, in the last minute, the players said that they would play for free. And this was on the advice of the players' union. Apparently, there had been bad publicity from the public and the press because of their demands. That, that was a time when, when the Federation had a lot of problems because even if we don't want to melange politics and sports, it's something different to don't do that. And the political situation in Argentina was very special 
and the Football Federation couldn't escape that problems. And in that time, it was very unusual to have stability with, for example, a manager. And Menotti was trying hardly to do that, to have time to put his work in order. That was the main goal of Menotti. And he did it. Just two days later, on February 27th, again, part of the Copa del Atlantico and also Copa Roca, Argentina hosted Brazil at Buenos Aires at Estadio Monumental. For this match, Menotti selected the following squad. Ricardo Lavolpe in goal from San Lorenzo. Andres Rebotaro of Newell's Old Boys. This was his sixth and final cap. All his caps were in 1975 and 1976. Alberto Tarantini of Boca Juniors. Juan Pablo Cardenas of Racing Club. Again, this was also his sixth and final cap for Argentina. And all his caps were in 75 and 76. Daniel Killer of Rosario Central. Ricardo Boccini of Independiente. Americo Gallego of Newell's Old Boys. Marcello Trobiani of Boca Juniors. And he'd be replaced by Julio Assad of Vélez Sarsfield in the 70th minute. This was Assad's seventh and final cap as well. All his caps in 1975 and 1976. Oscar Ortiz of San Lorenzo. Again, captain beside Mario Kempes of Rosario Central and Hector Scotta of San Lorenzo. And he replaced by Rene Hausman of Huracan in the 57th minute. Let's also go quickly go through the Brazil lineup. You have Walter Perez in goal from Sao Paulo, Getulio from Atletico Mineiro, Miguel of Fluminense, Amaral of Garani, Marinho Chagas of Botafogo, Chicao of Sao Paulo, Paulo Roberto Falcao of Internacional Porto Alegre, Flecha of Garani, Geraldo of Flamingo, he replaced by Palinha of Cruzeiro in the 54th minute, Zico of Flamingo, Lula of Internacional Porto Alegre, he replaced by Edu Bala of Palmeiras in the 77th minute, for the side managed by Osvaldo Brandao. As far as the match itself, Lula gave Brazil the lead in the 57th minute. Zico doubled the lead with a free kick in the 67th minute. And Mario Kempes pulled a goal back from a penalty kick in the 74th minute. Brazil won 2-1 at Argentina. But as far as Assad, Cardenas, and Rebortaro, Menotti saw that they would not be part of his plans for the future. This time, I think that Menotti was trying to use a lot of players of San Lorenzo because Ortiz, Escota, they were in the lineup in San Lorenzo at the time. And Escota, in 1975, was the striker of the all the year of 1975. And after these matches, he was sold to Sevilla in Spain. In Spain. And I think that as we talked last time, Gallego was uh, now a key player in the middle field. Also, Kempes, who was going to be sell to Valencia in Spain, was starting to make appearances with more frequency and became one of the key players too. And in the defense, we have the goalkeeper. You can notice that, for example, Filiol, who was... In 1978, one of the most important pieces in the team wasn't in this time in the, the national team because he was doing his first appearances with River Play. In 1975, Filiol was the goalkeeper selected by Angel Labruna, who was the coach in River. He replaced an historical goalkeeper called Perico Perez and Filiol was one of the most important players in, in River. And after this, Menotti put the eye on him. And in a couple of years from now, we are going to notice that he became the, the number one in the national team. 
We should also mention that for this match, due to last minute technical difficulties, the match was not televised in Brazil. As a result, there were a lot of complaints that Argentina is not in a position to be able to host the World Cup. There would always be during this year, there would always be complaints like that or questioning whether Argentina can actually host a World Cup. Next month, for the month of March, Argentina goes to a tour of Europe to play friendly matches against the Soviet Union, Poland, and Hungary. The first match on the tour was on March 20th, 1976 at Kiev with Soviet Union hosting Argentina. For this match, Menotti selected Hugo Gatti of Boca Juniors in goal, Alberto Tarantini of Boca Juniors, capping the side Jorge Omar Carascosa of Huracan, Daniel Killer of Rosario Central, making his first appearance for the national team, Jorge Mario Olguin of San Lorenzo, Ricardo Bocchini of Independiente, and replacing him another debutante, Daniel Alberto Passarella of River Plate in the 61st minute, the future captain. Then you have Americo Gallego of Newell's Old Boys, Marcello Trobiani of Boca Juniors, Osvaldo Ardiles of Huracan, Mario Campes of Rosario Central. He'd be replaced by Rene Hausman of Huracan in the 68th minute, and Leopoldo Luque of River Plate. This match, Menotti found two of his vital pieces for the World Cup, Olguin and Passarella in defense. Mm -hmm. And I will add also Luque, who was the striker in or the number nine in 1978. Yes, he was doing also his first matches in River Plate, where he was selected to replace Carlos Morete, who was a striker in 1975 and was then sold to Las Palmas. And mm -hmm. Luque, he used to play in Union de Santa Fe, small team in, in the city of Santa Fe. And uh, he was selected by La Bruna also to replace Morete. And he became one of the most important strikers in the history of River Plate too. And we should mention he sadly passed away earlier this year. Yes, yes, yeah. because of the COVID. Yes. And we also have a recall for Ardiles in midfield. So it seems like the team is taking shape, Menotti's ideal team. And let's quickly go through the Soviet lineup managed by Valery Lobanovsky and Oleg Vasilevich. So you have Alexander Prokhorov of Spartak Moscow, Nikolai Abramov of Spartak Moscow, Vyacheslav Leschuk of Chernomorets Odessa, Yevgeny Lovchev, captain the side from Spartak Moscow, Alexander Makovikov of Dynamo Moscow. He replaced by Vladimir Troshkin of Dynamo Kiev in the 46th minute. Alexander Minaev of Dynamo Moscow. Vladimir Sakharov of Torpedo Moscow. Anatoly Konkov of Dynamo Kiev. He replaced by Mikhail Fomenko of Dynamo Kiev in the 53rd minute. Leonid Nazarenko of CSK Moscow. He replaced by Vladimir Onyshenko of Dynamo Kiev in the 46th minute. Vladimir Vermeyev of Dynamo Kiev. Vladimir Fedorov of Pachator Tashkent and be replaced by Oleg Blochin of Dynamo Kiev in the 46th minute. Hats off. Yes. Well, the match will be won by Argentina 1-0 with Kempes scoring in the 43rd minute. So a satisfactory first match on the tour. Yes, I remember a lot that match because it was playing the snow, something, of course, very unusual here in Argentina. And, and that match, I remember Ugati, the goalkeeper, using uh, Bini, and he was one of the most important players in, in that match. I remember a lot uh, that I was so impressed by that match and the work of Gatti that I draw, I don't have it anymore, of course. That was a long time ago. But I made a draw of Ugo Gatti holding the ball in one center. 
I think in the internet, we could find it. If we put in Google <laughs> Gatti Kiev, you will see that picture. I'm sure of that. Yeah, Gatti, we've discussed, he's a legendary Argentinian goalkeeper. He never got too many caps, but within culture of Argentinian football, he's very famous. And I think we discussed him last time, if I'm not mistaken. I have here in El Grafico, I have, it's the, the title of the article that I remember a lot, was Gatti, El Hombre de Kiev, Gatti, the man of Kiev. A few days later, on March 24th, Argentina were to play in Poland at Chorzo. But on the same day, the military junta led by General Jorge Videla took over the nation in a coup. Obviously, that would have profound uh, ramifications for the future of the nation, as well as whether the World Cup could be held at all. But before that, Argentina had to play against Poland for that match at Chorzo. Menotti uh-huh. selected the following squad. Hugo Gatti in goal from Boca Juniors. Jorge Olguin of San Lorenzo. Daniel Killer of Rosario Central. Capping the side, Jorge Carascosa of Huracan. Alberto Tarantini of Boca Juniors. Marcello Trobiani of Boca Juniors. He replaced by Osvaldo Ardiles of Huracan in the 71st minute. Americo Gallego of Newell's Old Boys. Ricardo Buccini of Independiente. Hector Scotta of San Lorenzo. He replaced by Rene Hausman of Huracan in the 64th minute. Leopoldo Luque of River Plate. And Mario Campes of Rosario Central. And quickly going to the Polish side, managed by Kazimierz Zgorski. We have Stanislav Burzinski of Wizio Lodz. Antoni Zimanowski of Wisla Krakow. He replaced by Wojciech Rudy of Zaglebi Sosnowiec in the 46th minute. Jerzy Gorgon of Gornik Zabrze. Vladislav Zmuda of Slask Rokla. Henrik Wawrowski of Pogon Zesin. Zbigniew Boniek of Vizio Lodz. He replaced by Janusz Kupczewicz of Arka Gdynia in the 64th minute. Capping the side, Kazimir Zdena of Legio Varsa. Lesla Smikiewicz of Legio Varsa. Gersgors Lato of Stal Mielek. He replaced by Jan Benigier of Ruchorzo in the 46th minute, who in turn will be replaced by Pavel Janas of Vizio Lutz in the 75th minute, Anzed Jarmach of Gornik Zabze, and Kazimierz Kmiechik of Wisla Krakow. So very good side, who had actually defeated Argentina just two years before. During the of course. Cup. They had finished in the third place in the World Cup in Germany. It was a very strong team. It was partially the same team that they use in the World Cup and with some new players, but what are players like Boniek, for example, who was yes. a young fellow and became one of the most important Poland players in history. For this match, actually, Poland took the lead from an Olympic goal, scored directly from a corner by Kazimierz Kamiecik in the 58th minute. Though Argentina would fight back and just minutes later in the 63rd minute, Scotta would tie the match and Hausman would score Argentina's second goal in the 69th minute to give a 2-1 win for Argentina. So, so far, two positive results during the tour. But obviously, it was the events at home that overshadowed this match. Yeah, that's right. Some players said that they didn't know after, only after the match, that what was occurring here in Argentina. Others said that they knew and that they had to play anyway, that they didn't want to, but that a military message was sent to continue playing in the tour. So it's not so clear what was the real thing happening. Because, of course, in that, at that time, it was nothing like nowadays that you have the information at the second that it has passed. 
But I remember I was at school and those times were very difficult for everybody. Even if I was a kid, I had 10 years at that time. I remember because uh, in my house, they were all the time speaking about politics and all the things that were going on. The tour continued and just three days later, they were at Budapest at the Nep Stadion with Hungary hosting the Argentinians. For this match, Menotti selected the following squad. Hugo Gatti of Boca Juniors in goal. Alberto Tarantini of Boca Juniors. Jorge Carascosa, capping the side from Huracan. Daniel Killer of Rosario Central. Jorge Olguin of San Lorenzo. Ricardo Bocchini of Independiente. Américo Gallego of Newell's Old Boys. Osvaldo Ardiles of Huracan, Mario Kempes of Rosario Central, Leopoldo Luque of River Plate. He replaced by Marcello Trobiani of Boca Juniors in the 56th minute. Hector Scotta of San Lorenzo, and he replaced by Rene Hausman of Huracan in the 59th minute. Quickly going through the Hungarian side, managed by Lajos Barotti. You have Sandor Gujdar of Honved in goal. Sandor Parojai of Bekesk Sabai, Lajlo Balint of Ferenc Varos, Tibor Rab of Ferenc Varos, Mihali Kantor of Vasas, Zoltan Ebedli of Ferenc Varos, Sandor Pinter of Onved, he replaced by Ferenc Zongradi of Videoton in the 70th minute, Tibor Nilasi of Ferenc Varos, Lajlo Fazkas of Ujpesh Doja, Istvan Weimper of Honved and Istvan Magyar of Ferenc Varos. And of course, the size would meet in the 1978 World Cup for Argentina. Mm-hmm. So I think probably the Argentinian side may have been overwhelmed with the situation at home. They did not have a, as good a display as the previous matches and lost the match 2 0. Nilasi mm-hmm. scored in the fourth minute. And Fazikas doubled the lead in the 80th minute. So uh-huh. they ended the tour with a loss. The positives were the discovery of Olguin and Passarella, perhaps. Yeah, sure. Olguin, Passarella, as we mentioned before, uh, Luque also. And if you notice, Ardiles and Gallego were starting to be two key pieces from the middle field. And yes. they used to work together, knowing each one, and that was very important for the future. It's a little bit unusual to have a tour in the in the middle of the season like this. Was the league stopped for this? No, no I don't remember exactly at that time, but it, it was something that perhaps they didn't use to cut the league. You continue with the players that you still have in the team. It's something that nowadays it's happening. For example, the, the, the last tournament was finished when there was national teams playing for the World Cup qualification. And for example, Racing Club, who lost the final, lost his goalkeeper because he used to play for Chile. And he was the key player in the team in Racing and They had to play without the goalkeeper. But I don't remember if in that time, because one of the things that Menotti wanted to do, and he did, was to have 40 players that were not going to be sell to any foreign club so that he could have them in Argentina and train anytime that he wants to. But I don't remember if that was in 76 or a year later in 77? It's, it's this year and we'll get to that. Ah, okay. It's later on during the year where that law comes into effect. So My memory is still working, huh? <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Uh, I was And I was going to mention that the Argentinian football calendar is different than the European calendar. I think you have yeah. Campeonato at, Metropolitano and then you have Campeonato, at, I guess, National. National, yes. Right. At, at that time, at that time, we had a calendar year. I mean, the tournament started in more or less February. We have the Campeonato Metropolitano, who was the most important and used to play with the first division, for example. 
and the Nacional was a, a mix of a cup and tournament too. And that was in the second part of the year. But the season was not divided as in Europe, for example, 76, 77, mm -hmm. but only that year calendar of 76. Argentina concluded its tours with friendly matches against Erta Berlin of West Germany on March 30th, where they lost 2-1. And also on April 1st at Sevilla, they played a scoreless match against the FC Sevilla. Let me add something. That was something that at that time was something that they usually do to play with teams, not with national teams. I remember, for example, national team from Europe that used to play in friendly tournaments here in Argentina. And nowadays, you don't see that anymore. I mean, you don't see, for example, Argentina doing a friendly match with, uh, I don't know, Sevilla, for example, as you mentioned. Yeah, it was more frequent when teams were on tour. Yes. They would sometimes play against club I remember. Club teams, I remember. Yeah. Even, even if it's not considered an official match for the FIFA, no? Right, right. When the squad returned to Argentina for the month of April, they were still involved with the Copa del Atlantico, the continuation of Copa del Atlantico. On April 8th, as part of, again, Copa del Atlantico and also the long-running Copa Lipton, Argentina... <laughs> hosted Uruguay at Buenos Aires at Vela Sarsfield Stadium. Mm -hmm. That's the Jose Amalfitani. Yes, Jose Amalfitani, that's correct, yes. For this match, Menotti selected the following squad. Hugo Gatti of Boca Juniors in goal, Jorge Olguin of San Lorenzo, capping the side Jorge Carascosa of Huracan, Daniel Killer of Rosario Central, Americo Gallego of Newell's Old Boys. Starting for the first time, Daniel Passarella of River Plate. Mm -hmm. Rene Hausman of Huracan. He'd be replaced by Hector Scotta of San Lorenzo in the 62nd minute. Osvaldo Ardiles of Huracan. He'd be replaced by Marcelo Trobiani of Boca Juniors in the 62nd minute. Leopoldo Luque of River Plate. Ricardo Boccini of Independiente and Mario Campes of Rosario Central. And quickly going through the Uruguayan side managed by Jose Maria Rodriguez. You have Walter Corbo of Peñarol, Alfredo de los Santos of Nacional, Rafael Villazan of Nacional, Pablo Forlan of Peñarol, Saul Rivero of Atletico Espanol, a Mexican side. One, Vicente Morales of Cerro. He be replaced by Manuel Gregorio Keoseyan of Danubio in the 46th minute. Jose Eduardo Cruz of Peñarol. Dario Alfonso Pereira of Nacional. Fernando Morena of Peñarol. Julio Cesar Jimenez of Peñarol. Jorge Laclo of Nacional, he replaced by Daniel Torres of Danubio in the 70th minute. Mm -hmm. This would be a comfortable win for Argentina. First, Campus would actually miss a penalty kick in the 11th minute. Yes. But he would score 10 minutes later. Luque would double the lead in the 51st minute. Campus would score his second goal in the 57th minute. In the meantime, Pereira would pull a goal back for Uruguay in the 79th minute. And Scotta would finish the scoring in the 89th minute for a 4-1 Argentina win. So a comfortable win against their neighbors. It's some kind of derby. It's the, the derby of the River Plate, the derby of El Rio de la Plata. Another piece of report that I came to when I was researching it is that either prior or after this match, a poll was taken from 18 players of the Argentinian squad. And seven of them said that they would go abroad for the right offer. Seven of them said they would stay in the nation for the World Cup. Three were undecided. And one of the players said that he would stay only if he was guaranteed for the World Cup. 
So this kind of just show that at least half the squad would be willing to leave for a better offer. And if if I I have here the team and you have that, for example, Escota and then Empes, they finish uh, playing a year later or, or less in Europe, in Spain. And, and I, I don't I don't remember if Tro, Troviani too, he went to Spain. I, I don't remember at that time or of a year later, but he went also to Spain. From that team, there was some kind of talk that perhaps at that time, Gatti was going to leave for Boca Juniors and, and going to play in, in Europe. But that was a gossip. It, did, it didn't occur that. And I just quickly checked, uh, Trobiani joined Elche in Spain for the following season. Okay. My memory is still working. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm 20 days later, on April 28th, again, as part of this Copa del Atlantico and also Copa Felix Bogado, Argentina hosted Paraguay. Again, at Vela Sarsfield, at Buenos Aires, at Jose Amalfitani. For this match... Menotti selected Ricardo La Volpe in goal from San Lorenzo, Alberto Tarantini of Boca Juniors, capping the side Jorge Carascosa of Huracan, Daniel Killer of Rosario Central, Ricardo Buccini of Independiente, Américo Gallego of Newell's Old Boys, Osvaldo Ardiles of Huracan, Jorge Olguin of San Lorenzo, Mario Kempes of Rosario Central. He replaced by Hector Scotta of San Lorenzo in the 68th minute. Leopoldo Luque of River Plate. And Rene Hausman of Huracan. The match would end 2-2. Kempes would score in the 48th and the 50th minute. And Paraguay would score in the 70th minute through Rivera. And Aquino would score a penalty kick in the 72nd minute. However, the controversy of this match surrounded the local Argentinian referee, Angel Norberto Coerreza. Mm -hmm. So he was accused by the Argentina fans and the press for over penalizing Argentina to appear to be a fair referee. He was accused of awarding a penalty kick. This was after Olguin had committed a handball in the box. He repeatedly ignored Paraguay's rough play, according to the Argentinian observers. And he also refused to award a penalty kick for Argentina after a foul on Luque. That, that's very strange also because two teams and the referee is from one of those countries, something that nowadays... Also. Almost never happens, yeah. No, no, no. I, I was uh, reading and I said Coereza, but why? Why Coereza? <laughs> I don't remember uh, why at that time it was. this was something perhaps that could pass, but nowadays it's something that you will never see again. A referee from one of the teams, from one of the nationality of, of the teams that are playing. Even if Coereza was one of the most important referee in the history of Argentine football, without doubt. Now we come to the month of May. Again, part of the Copa Atlantico. So this time, Brazil is hosting Argentina at Maracana. Again, a part of the Copa del Atlantico and also Copa Roca. For this match, this match, again, let's uh, also mention that it was played under a rain and a muddy field. Menotti selected the following squad. Ricardo La Volpe in goal from San Lorenzo. Alberto Tarantini of Boca Juniors. Jorge Olguin of San Lorenzo. Daniel Passarella of River Plate. Capping the side, Jorge Carascosa of Huracan. Marcelo Trobiani of Boca Juniors. Américo Gallego of Newell's Old Boys. Ricardo Buccini of Independiente. He replaced by... Norberto Alonso of River Plate in the 46th minute. Rene Hausman of Huracan. Leopoldo Luque of River Plate. He replaced by Jose Daniel Valencia of Taleres de Cordoba in the 46th minute. 
and Mario Kempes. I want to mention that Menotti, one of the most important things that he did was to use players from teams like Talleres de Córdoba, but because usually the managers used to select players from the most important teams like River Boca, Independiente, Huracán, San Lorenzo, Racing. But Menotti, he did a lot of work in all the country and select players from, for example, New Soul Boys like Gallego and, as you mentioned, Valencia, who was uh, a very good player, uh, number 10. He used to play in middle field and he selected from Talleres de Córdoba, who was at that time a team that was not so very important. Going through the Brazilian side, managed by Osvaldo Brandao, you have Valder Perez of Sao Paulo, Orlando of America Tio, Jaime of Flamingo, Amaral of Garani, he replaced by Beto Fuscao of Gremio in the 46th minute, Marco Antonio of Vasco da Gama, Chicao of Sao Paulo, he replaced by Paulo Roberto Falcao of Internacional Porto Alegre in the 68th minute, Roberto Rivellino of Fluminense, Gilles of Fluminense, Geraldo of Flamingo, Neca of Gremio, and Lula of Internacional Porto Alegre. Uh, and let's mention that also that this was La Volpe's eighth and final cap. All his caps would be 75 and 76. However, he would be part of the 1978 World Cup squad mm -hmm. as a backup goalkeeper. I wanted to mention that because it was his last cap, but he was part of the team which won the World Cup in 1978. For this match, Brazil were victorious. Lula scored in the 64th minute and Neca in the 88th minute. They lost twice to Brazil in this year. But what I'm also noticing is that it's less a year of experimentation this year. It seems like Menotti is kind of sticking to number of players regularly from match to match and not throwing out too many new caps, it seems like. I think he was already starting to have a group of players that he thought at that time, I think, that they were going to be the team that will be selected to play in the World Cup. Because from this starting 11, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight players that will do it till the World mm -hmm. Cup. And the two, Valencia and Alonso, who make their appearance during the game, they also were at the World Cup. So you can notice that he was working with the players that he thought that they will be in the World Cup in Argentina two years later. And also the frequency of the matches from February, March, April, May, now into June. There's a lot of matches for these few uh -huh. months as part of his preparations. That was very unusual at the time because the national team didn't use to, to tour a lot. So to have so many matches in six months, more or less, that was very important to, I think that it will be something that for Menotti was very important to give... Um, to, to mold the first, team, basically. Yeah. To mold, that's right. Exactly. Uh -huh. That's right. A year later, it will occur the same. So we come to the month of June, June 9th, at Montevideo's Estadio Centenario, Uruguay was hosting Argentina, again as part of this Copa del Atlantico and also Copa Newton. For this match, Hugo Gatti starts in goal from Boca Juniors. He will be sent off in the 40th minute. Mm -hmm. for touching the ball twice outside of the box. That was very Hugo Gatti because he used to play with his feet and he used to play outside the penalty box and sometimes that happens. <laughs> so you got Jorge Olguin of San Lorenzo, captain the side, Jorge Carascosa of Huracan, Alberto Tarantini of Boca Juniors, Daniel Passarella of River Plate, Americo Gallego of Newell's Old Boys, Rene Hausman of Huracan. And because Hugo Gatti was sent off, Hausman had to make way 
and an outfield player, and he replaced by Hector Ballet of Huracan to go in goal. Then you have Osvaldo Ardiles of Huracan, Leopoldo Luque of River Plate, who replaced by Hector Scotta of San Lorenzo in the 16, 62nd minute, Ricardo Bocchini of Independiente, and Mario Campes of Rosario Central. We should mention that this was Scotta's seventh and final cap. And obviously his transfer to Europe would end his international career. We would get to that. But just to mention that in seven matches, he scored five goals. Mm -hmm. My guess is had he not left, he certainly would have been part of Menotti's players. Sure. Sure. He was a terrific striker. I think also that if he would stay in Argentina, he would be part of, of that national team. But decisions are decisions. And also mention that this was Hector Ballet's second cap for Argentina. Mm-hmm. Ballet was his surname, sorry, his, his surname was Chocolate, Chocolate. Oh, because he was a little black and he was known as Chocolate Ballet, Chocolate Ballet. He was a very good goalkeeper and Menotti used to have him also playing in Huracan. Ballet, uh, he was also the backup goalkeeper, I guess, up to the 1982 World Cup. I think Ballet was part of the squad, if I'm not mistaken. In the 82, let me see. It was, okay, I think, yes, because Pompido was the, the third goalkeeper, Filiol the first, and Ballet the second one, yes. The, he was a very good goalkeeper, but he had in front of him... Filiol, uh, Gatti, and everybody, yeah. Uh, also, quickly going through the Uruguay squad managed by Jose Maria Rodriguez, you have Walter Corbo of Peñarol, Walter Oliveira of Peñarol, Nils Roque Chagas of Danubio, he replaced by Alfredo de los Santos of Nacional in the 46th minute, Gustavo Faral of Peñarol, Lorenzo Unanu of Peñarol, Sergio Ramirez of Huracan Bucheo of Montevideo, Jose Hermes Moreira of Danubio, he replaced by Valdemar Victorino of River Plate of Montevideo in the 46th minute. Manuel Gregorio Keoseyan of Danubio. Fernando Moreno of Peñarol. Julio Cesar Jimenez of Peñarol. And Vicente Rudy Rodriguez of Defensor. For this match, despite being a man down, Argentina had already taken a 3-0 lead before Gatti was sent off. Lucas scored in the second minute, Kepes scored in the 11th minute, and Hausman scored in the 28th minute. And Argentina won the match 3-0. So they heavily defeated Uruguay twice within a couple of months of each other. This was the story until the middle of the year. Now, there would be a four-month break before Argentina would play its next match. It would be in October. However, there was a lot of news concerning the national team in these intervening months. There were reports that the relationship between the Federation and Menotti had deteriorated in these months. Apparently, the Federation did not allow Menotti to travel to Europe because he wanted to observe and watch the Euro finals matches in June 1976. The Federation also withdrew Argentina's squad from the prestigious Toulon Youth Tournament after the players had wanted double the bonuses offered by the Federation. The Federation had obviously refused and Menotti was accused of siding with the players. Also, Menotti had wanted a tour of Europe in August, but that was canceled by the Federation due to the delay in the Argentinian First Division program. Other things to keep in mind is that following the coup, the World Cup organizing committee was now headed by usually a general from the regime and not the actual Federation. At this point, the Federation, which was the only entity recognized by FIFA, now acted as only as technical advisors 
to the organizing committee led by the regime. Going into August and September, there were again reports of problems, of shortages, of hotels being built. And getting back to the organizing committee, I think I believe at some point one of the generals was assassinated. I'm trying to find some information. I, I remember that Menotti in, in 1976, when the military government interrupted the democracy here in Argentina, at first he didn't want to continue in managing, but he, because he didn't want to become part of the military government. I mean, that the military could use the national team and the World Cup as uh, some kind of show to the world how was mm. Argentina. I think that it was something very difficult because I remember that magazine El Grafico, when it was the first week of the tournament, the world tournament here, they used to publish an open letter. I don't know if it was so, so open, written by... Uh, Rudy Kroll, Rudy right? Kroll. Oh yes, that's right. <laughs> who was the who was the captain of the Dutch team, the Holland team, saying that in Argentina was everything beautiful. Yes. That and I remember this: that military who were escorting the team, they used flowers instead of uh-huh. rifles. No, Nacho, this was allegedly a letter he had written to his daughter. That's how that's they right. sold it. That's- yes. And of that, course, Kroll denied say, everything. <laughs> you say, I don't know. They say that that letter was written to his daughter. Yes. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know. It was something very doubtful. No, he denied it. Kroll denied it. He said he, he had no idea how that was ever published or how you know they that came up. <laughs> I, I used to, I, I had the pleasure to, to meet Kroll in the middle eighties, uh, he came here to play in some kind of, of TV program that they used to play. I don't remember for four aside or five aside and different players from Europe used to come here. And I, I, I talked to him to Ruth Kroll, but he didn't answer that question. <laughs> he didn't want to, he was, oh, when I, I mentioned this, do you wrote a letter to him? Oh, he, 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 <laughs> mad and, okay, okay, no, no, no. <laughs> so, I don't know. I think that because of what uh, the manners at that time he gave to me, I think that he didn't wrote and that he was very uh, uh, not so happy with, uh, about what happened. Getting back to the team, in September, Menotti drew up a list of 66 players that were to be declared untransferable to Europe until after the World Cup. In another source, I have it says that it was actually 37 players, but that the number could rise up to 66. So anywhere between 37 and 66 players that he declared untransferable, something that would, I think it would be illegal today if you did something like this. But, uh, oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but those illegal and impossible. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Imagine one manager from any country saying, okay, all these players, it's impossible to sell them. So they have to stay here for two years and a half. Oh. <laughs> yes. unthinkable these days but yeah I think it was 40 players that he select on that list and that they were going to stay here in Argentina from that list they were the 22 players that they later played the, the World Cup however just before this deadline Campes had joined Valencia Mm-hmm. Norberto Alonso had joined Olympic Marseille. Mm-hmm. Scotta had joined Sevilla. And we mentioned Trobiani had joined Elche. Mm-hmm. But Alonso, he went to Marseille. Yes. But uh, just a couple of months, I think uh, six months or, or four months, and he came back to River. 
Yes. Uh, I went to the, that match when he played for the first time again in River. Menotti said that Kempes and Alonso are out of his World Cup plans when they did that. With Alonso, there was some kind of trouble later because he was in a good, in a very good level in '78, but he wasn't in the starting eleven. Uh, yes. So, well, this is a discussion for the next podcast for the year 1977. But do you remember in the summer of '77 when Argentina hosted all the touring European teams? Mm-hmm. Basically, it seemed like half the European continent had. It was touring Argentina that summer. Yes, I so, remember. Yeah, I, I was heard that series of matches was played in uh, La Bombonera, the Boca Junior Stadium, because the River Stadium was still works to finalize the Estadio Monumental, who was going to be the most important stadium to host the World Cup. And I remember that I went to see in that series of matches. I went. Uh, when they play with uh, France, that oh, was yes. the the only time that I saw Platini uh, playing in, in a field. Yes, I think in fact today is the anniversary of that match, June twenty sixth. Yeah. Yes, I thought. Is. I think if 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 my memory is not working bad, I think we play against France, England. Germany, West with Germany, England, and Scotland too. Here Scotland, in, in, Yugoslavia, and East Germany, and Poland. Okay, incredible. Was, but what I was going to mention is that Campus did not play that year. And it was after these series of matches that Menotti saw that he needs to have Campus back. But again, that's a longer discussion for the next one. But getting back to this year, Menotti himself said that he personally does not blame players going abroad for money because he did it himself. However, he said that, this is his quote, that who is to say their Spanish clubs would let me have Ayala, that's uh, Ruben Ayala, Raton from Atletico Madrid, and Campes. And how could I even play them in the finals if they have not been part of the squad playing in the build-up matches first? As far as he was concerned, if you left Argentina the national team was over for you at this point. And he would only make this exception for the World Cup, for Campus, and I think maybe even perhaps Osvaldo Piazza, but that's a different discussion. Yes, because Piazza, he was playing in uh, Saint Etienne, went to Saint Etienne, where he became one of the icons of, of that team of Saint-Étienne that played the final... Glasgow 1976. Yeah, in in Glasgow. He was a very good player, very good defender, but had some kind of uh, trouble with her wife when he was called up for one of those matches. Her wife, I thought, that had a car accident. Yes, yes. he, he He decided to stay with her. And for that, he was not called back to the national team. After this four-month break, we come back to matches. Mm -hmm. On October 13th, Argentina hosted Chile as part of the Copa Carlos Ditborn Pinto at Buenos Aires at uh, Vélez Sarsfield Stadium at Jose Amalfitani. Those, those, those names of the Cups are something special. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For this match, Menotti selected Hugo Gatti in goal from Boca Juniors, Alberto Tarantini of Boca Juniors, Jorge Olguin of San Lorenzo, Daniel Killer of Rosario Central, Jose Daniel Valencia of Taleres, Osvaldo Ardiles of Huracan, Americo Gallego of Newell's Old Boys, capping the side Jorge Carascosa of Huracan, Daniel Bertoni returning to the side from Independiente. He played, I believe, in Menotti's first match, maybe the previous yes. 1974. But yeah, this was his only his second he cap. Played, so, he was left aside and he called him back and he was one of the most important players also in, in the World Cup. Yes. 
That's incredible. When, when, you, when you, you see this chronologically, but you know the, what, what, what will be the final result, it's incredible. You say, wow, for example, La Volpe didn't play, and the next match, it was Ballet who replaced Gatti. And in that way, Ballet became the second goalkeeper to be selected. And there are some things that when you see all this in chronologically, it's amazing. You have Rene Hausman of Huracan. He replaced by Ricardo Villa of Tucaman in the 80th minute. Again, he was recalled to the national team. I think his last cap was like a year before. Mm. And again, he, like you said, he would be part of the World Cup squad. You have a new cap. Jose Luis Saldano of Colón Santa Fe. Oh. And he'd be replaced by another debutant. Alberto Beltran of River Plate in the 75th minute. The witch, La Bruja. Uh, oh, Beltran? Beltran. Uh. Yes. The surnames of the 70s, oh, they were amazing too. Yeah. Well, for Beltran, this would be his one and only cap, those 15 minutes he played in this match. And quickly going through the Chile lineup managed by Copolican Peña. You have Adolfo Neff of Colo Colo, Enzo Escobar of Union Española, Leonel Herrera of Union Española, Rafael González of Union Española, Antonio Arias of Union Española, Nelson Sanueza of Universidad Católica, Mario Soto Benavides of Union Española, Miguel Ángel Nera of Union Española, Leonardo Veliz of Union Española, Julio Cristosto of Colo-Colo. Uh, he replaced by Mario Salinas of Everton of Viña del Mar. Gustavo Moscoso of Universidad Católica. He replaced by Luis Miranda of Union Española. For this match, Argentina took the lead in the second minute with a penalty kick through Osvaldo Ardiles. And Daniel Bertoni would score in the 88th minute for his recall for the national team. So Argentina won 2-0. But obviously, no more campus in the team, no more Scota. Maybe that's why it prompted uh, Menotti to recall Bertoni, among others. Yes, but perhaps. There were a lot of very good players and attackers and wingers. For example, Hoseman, Bertoni. Uh, Ortiz, Escota, you have five names, and those five could fit in the starting 11 without any trouble. So it was a difficult choice, I think. On October 28th, Peru hosted Argentina as part of Copa Ramon Castilla at Lima. For this match, Menotti selected Hugo Gatti in goal from Boca Juniors, Capping beside Jorge Carascosa of Huracan, Daniel Pasarella of River Plate, Jorge Olguin of San Lorenzo, Alberto Tarantini of Boca Juniors, Daniel Bertoni of Independiente, Jose Daniel Valencia of Tarreres, Osvaldo Ardiles of Huracan, he replaced by Ricardo Villa of Tucuman in the 70th minute, Americo Gallego of Newell's Old Boys, Rene Hausman of Huracan, Jose Luis Saldano of Colón Santa Fe, and he replaced by debutant Raúl Francisco Aguero of Rosario Central in the 46th minute. That's not the coon, huh? Let's say. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So for this match, Argentina would be victorious 3-1. Hausman would score in the 48th minute and the 78th minute. Daniel Passarella scored his first goal for Argentina in the 75th minute. And Quezada pulled the goal back for Peru in the 90th minute. A win against a relatively decent Peruvian side who would also qualify for the 1978 World Cup. Yes, and it was, was one of the best teams because they qualified to the second tour of the tournament. They had, I remember, Kubisha, who was an extremely free-kick taker, one of, of the course. best. 
Uh, and I remember he scored, I think, against Scotland, perhaps. In the yes, World Cup. he scored five what? goals, tw- tw- I mean, two beautiful goals against Scotland. Low range yeah. shots, yeah. yeah. A few weeks later, on November 10th, again as part of Copa Ramon Castilla, this time Argentina hosted Peru at Buenos Aires at the Vélez Sarsfield Stadium, Jose Amalfitani. For this match, Menotti selected Hector Ballé of Huracan in goal, Roberto Muzo of Boca Juniors, Alberto Tarantini of Boca Juniors, Daniel Passarella of River Plate, Capping the side, Jorge Olguin of San Lorenzo. Ricardo Villa of Tucaman. He'd be replaced by Osvaldo Ardiles of Huracan in the 59th minute. Americo Gallego of Newell's Old Boys. Jose Daniel Valencia of Taleres. Daniel Bertoni of Independiente. Rene Hausman of Huracan. Raul Francisco Aguero of Rosario Central. This was his second and final cap for Argentina. He made his debut in a previous match against Peru. And he replaced by Jose Luis Saldano of Colón Santa Fe. We should also mention a Muzo. This was his second cap for Argentina. This was his recall to the national team. For this match, Argentina won 1-0. Passarella scoring again in the 63rd minute. He's already showing his prowess in defending as well as scoring goals. And he'd be one of the best defender goal scorers in history. Incredible. He I'm scored sorry. 99 goals here in Argentina for River Plate. And many, many goals for the national team. And just remember his long-range free kick against Italy in 1982. <laughs> yes. We come to the last match of the calendar year. On November 28th, Argentina hosted the Soviet Union at Buenos Aires at Estadio Monumental. For this match, Menotti selected the following squad. Hugo Gatti in goal from Boca Juniors. Alberto Tarantini of Boca Juniors. Captain Desire Jorge Carascosa of Huracan. Daniel Killer of Rosario Central. Jorge Olguin of San Lorenzo. Jose Daniel Valencia of Tarres. He replaced by debutant Juan Ramon Rocha of Newell's Old Boys in the 46th minute. Américo Gallego of Newell's Old Boys. Osvaldo Ardiles of Huracan. Jose Luis Saldano, just was his final cap, from Colón Santa Fe. He replaced by Ricardo Boccini of Independiente in the 46th minute. Daniel Bertoni of Independiente and Rene Hausman of Huracan. Quickly going through the Soviet side managed by Valery Lobanovsky and Oleg Basilievich. You have Nikolai Gontar of Dynamo Moscow in goal, Viktor Kruglov of Torpedo Moscow, Anatoly Parov of Dynamo Moscow, Shota. Kincha Gashvili of Dynamo Tbilisi, Sergei Olshansky of CSK Moscow, Manuchar Machaidze of Dynamo Tbilisi, Alexander Tarkanov of CSK Moscow, Vladimir Suchilin of Torpedo Moscow. He'll be replaced by Alexander Berezhnoi of Dynamo Kiev in the 72nd minute, Nazar Petrosian of Arad Erevan. Yuri Chesnokov of CSK Moscow. He replaced by Petr Slobodian of Dynamo Kiev in the 60th minute. And Oleg Dolmatov of Dynamo Moscow. The match would end as a scoreless tie. So it was a calendar year full of matches, full of preparatory matches. The takeaway is that there were not too many new caps. Menotti still did not have his final lineup, but he had a bulk of it. Many of the yes, players. And, and he, he has, for, for me, the most important thing that is that at that time, Gallego was surely the, here in Argentina, number five. Uh, it's the defensive middle field with Ardiles on his right. 
that was something that became crucial for Menotti. In the defense, Passarella was starting to make his first appearances, scoring goals, and becoming what he finally became. And Kempes, until he went to Valencia, was also a key player. And Luque, he played a lot of, of matches in, in 76, and he was finally selected. Uh, as usual, Hauseman was a player who Menotti knew a lot because he managed him in Huracan in 1973 when they won their only league. And uh, Hauseman was one of the most important players in, in, in that team. And he was usually called up in, in, in the national team. And he used it in different ways as in the starting 11 or during the match. But he was one of the, the players that he used to select every time. And only Philol and Galvan are missing to complete the puzzle, basically, for Menotti. And during this calendar year, as many as 16 players who would make the final squad appeared for the national team. We mentioned Norberto Alonso, although he was a peripheral figure of the team, he made an appearance this season. Obviously, Ardiles, Bale as backup goalkeeper, recall of Daniel Bertoni, uh-huh. Americo Gallego, Hausman, Campes, Daniel Killer, Killer. La, yeah, La Volpe as a backup goalkeeper, Luque, Olguin. Oscar Ortiz made an appearance earlier in the season. Obviously, he would be part yes. of the final squad. Passarella, Tarantini. of course, Tarantini, Valencia, and mm-hmm. Villa, but uh, mm-hmm. more as a uh, substitute option. Yes, uh, but he was developing the team that he will final select to, for the World Cup. Yes. Because I think, what, how many do you mention? More About or less? 16 players of the 22. That's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah, That's and they more. played a lot of games as well. So they obviously yeah. Yeah, had basically two yeah. years of playing together a lot of, yeah, a lot of games. Uh, yeah. Once again, the team with Gallego and Ardiles was something that for Menotti was starting to be something very important for him because they were always playing together. Gallego, yeah. Menotti. Eh, Gallego, Ardiles. Gallego, Ardiles. Gallego would not leave the side until 1982. He would be yes. a, a pillar of the team, basically. He was, he was a very important player. He was very tough. <laughs> he was a player that usually we said here in Argentina, he lived everything in the field. Yes. He leaves everything in the field. He played all the matches with the very intensity. And when Passarella became national team manager, I think Gallego was his assistant, in fact, wasn't he? Yes, sure. He was his assistant first in River Play. And then when he took the national team, Gallego stayed six months in River, where he won the league without losing any match. And after that, he went with Passarella in the national team. The previous year or two years, we should say, there were so many caps, as you said, Menotti used it as a laboratory that first That's year. More experim- experimental the, the, right. the first two years, because I think not only in the um, only talking about football, but I think of developing what was the organization of the football association at that time. So I think that took some time to Menotti to organize all that things that goes beyond the the, the field. And Mm. then I think that 1976 is is the first year where he started to look for the team that he will use in in the World Cup two years later. Was he already called El Flaco at this point or that came later? Our names in Argentina were <laughs> the most important things in the world. Yes, El Flaco, because he's... Uh, I saw him, I think, two years ago, because he used to have an office near where I work here in Argentina, in Buenos Aires. And I saw him a couple of times walking down there. 
I raised my hand and he, he gave it back, he gave it back. <laughs> and uh, he, he's still the same. He's like this. Yeah, yeah. He's El Flaco. He's El Flaco. <laughs> yes. He continue. I don't know how he, he but he, he's, he's one of the most important managers, without doubt, in, in Argentina. He and Bilardo. Of course. Uh, and of course, for me, Bielsa. But, uh, <laughs> but Menotti, for sure, was the one who changed the history of the national team in Argentina, yes. without doubt. Yeah, because before that, the post was very unstable. Managers would come and go. That's right. Yeah. Yes, Be because there was no, for example, in the World Cup in 74, I think that was Sibori, the one, the manager, but he, no. Vladislaw Cup, Cup, right? Cup, yeah, yes, Vladislaw. El Polaco Cup, Polish Cup. And there was a lot of trouble before Cup was Sibori, but he left right, right. a couple of months before the World Cup. That's things that nowadays will never occur, or perhaps it's not something so common to leave the national team when you are in the World Cup and he, a couple of months earlier, you leave the national team. The team is taking shape. The debate for next year would be obviously about Kempes that we'll discuss because mm -hmm. his absence would be sorely felt and Menotti would say he's the one player that he couldn't replace. Yes, yes. So he would have to go on his principles and recall Campus for the World Cup. He, he was the only player from that list of 40 that yeah. left and he called back. Yes. So only exception. It worked out for him. The takeaways, obviously, I think is Passarella and Olgun in defense. That basically yes. settled the defense more or less. Passarella not not only as, as, as a key player, but only as, but also I think as as a man for the group, because at that time usually the captain was and here's another one another one the the surnames El Perro Carrascosa the dog Carrascosa yes uh, he was the captain of that team. Uh, oh yes yes we'll get to the details for why he left as well that would happen in the okay. following year yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of stories this coming year. Paul, what do you think about this year? Yeah, it's interesting to see. Like we said, so many faces that have become familiar and become part of the, the World Cup team and, and to have such a long time to, to develop as a team and all, all the games that they played. And uh, yeah, this year, maybe there's, there's not so many games against the top European teams that will come later on. There's just the tour of Eastern Europe earlier on, and then Soviet Union again. But it's you know it's interesting to see that that team taking shape so early, really. But actually, the tour of Eastern Europe were actually against pretty decent sides. Oh yeah, they're they're, they're good teams. Yeah, yeah, it's just interesting. It was only Eastern Europe, and uh, right. except of except of the the Russian national team that didn't make it to that World Cup. Poland and I'm hungry uh, also they were some of the most important teams in by the time yes yeah yes. Poland were very strong at that time yeah yeah that's uh, true. Yes, sure so there's 1977 there'll be many 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 matches and the Argentina would test themselves against many different styles of European opposition I remember that at that time the Eastern Europe teams they used to play in a different way than the Occidental ones. So yes. it was very important to have those matches because I think that they gave Menotti a taste of what a World Cup will be. Yeah, different styles, much more so than now. Yeah. That's that's right. Because oh it was with the South American teams, there were Usually they play two or, th or three matches by year. And also uh, many of that players play in Argentina, used to play in Argentina. So I think that the, the most important thing that we will see in, in 1977 
is that they try to play with the very strong teams in the world. We look forward to this coming year, 1977, with even more important friendly matches to finalize the squad for 1978. It will be marvelous because I think that 1977 was one of the most important years of the Argentine football because they finally finish. Uh, I think that Menotti in 1977 he finished the work of selecting all the players that he will use a year later in in the World Cup. With that, once again, we would like to thank you, Mr. Di Mari, for your participation <clears throat> in this series. As always, feel free to leave questions and comments. You may contact me on my blog or on Facebook under Soccer Nostalgia. On Twitter, I'm at SP1873. Mr. Paul Whittle can be contacted on his blog, The 1888 Letter, and on Twitter, he's at 1888 Letter. You may also follow the podcast on Spotify under Soccer Nostalgia Talk Podcast. Mr. Dimari can be contacted on Twitter at L Oleg. And again, all this information is listed on the blog and Spotify posting. So, Nacho, thank you once again. And it's a pleasure for- to join you guys. I, I feel comfortable and we'll we be talking about 1977 for in sure. the future. Yeah, thank you and look forward to next time. Bye-bye. It's okay. Bye-bye.